50 years only really makes sense because between being at school and university, I became a, a temporary teacher in West London in teaching um, new Commonwealth immigrants, as they were uh, in, in those days. And so that's when I first began to take an interest in education policy. Uh, so it is 50 years, in fact, over 50 years. In a way, the, the dream that I probably had in those days that one day I would be Secretary of State for Education or um, at least have some influence on education policy uh, now seems uh, a, a bit um, remote. Uh, and I'm going to explain why I became sceptical during the course of those 50 years, whether you really could build a close link between education research and uh, education policy. My focus is on research and policy rather than on research and practice. Probably be some somewhat different considerations uh, if we were talking about research and classroom practice. Um, so I'm going to be talking at the level of how research interacts or doesn't react uh, with policy. So I'm going to start with a biographical introduction, which I've already slightly uh, um, gone into, and then talk about my life as a sociologist of education, my disillusion with that, but then my return to it. I suppose my engagement with sort of academic work on education policy began when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge. As was not uncommon in the 1960s, most of my time there was spent as a student activist, protesting against everything from the Vietnam War to my college's gate hours. And gate hours, um, I need to explain, meant that uh, visitors of the opposite sex had to be out by 11 o'clock, and we all had to be locked in by these huge medieval gates by, by midnight. That was one of the things I protested against. I was actually quite amazed um, a few years ago when I was sent a copy of the um, St John's College Cambridge 500 year history, which was full of the great and the good. Um, and like all uh, vain academics, I just flicked into the uh, index to see, actually to see if my brother, who is one of the great and good, some of you know, was um, featured in it. And I saw Witty and I thought, oh yeah, what's it say about Larry? It actually said, Witty G. What I discovered was that all, as a protesting student, I was perceived at the time as challenging, threatening the whole uh, of Western civilization, uh, And there were... Uh, in this book, there were excerpts from the college minutes saying how worried they were that uh, things were getting out of hand. Uh, and the real problem was they'd taken too many kids from grammar schools who hadn't uh, been socialised into uh, Oxbridge life through going to public boarding schools. If I'd only known at the time how frightened they were, we would have pushed a lot to a lot further and maybe brought down Western civilization, <laughs> or at least the um, Council of St John's College, Cambridge. More significantly, in terms of what actually happened, before I took to the barricades in 1968, was involved in my first year at Cambridge uh, in a Fabian Society study group that exposed me to the sociology of education for the first time, in particular to work that has since come to be known uh, as the old sociology of education drawing on social stratification studies in the political arithmetic tradition based at Nuffield College, Oxford, this sort of work studied the relationship between social background and educational achievement, largely in quantitative terms. It was epitomised by two people pictured there, A.H. Uh, Halsey and Jean Flood. Even though it was very different from the Marxist literature that I was reading as a student activist, this work's identification of working class underachievement as something uh, that was both an economic and a social uh, injustice convinced me that sociological studies of education, including the mapping of 
uh, inequalities by class in particular, but also uh, race and gender, could be an important educational and political resource. And indeed, uh, it can be argued that the work of the old sociology of education had a significant uh, role in the introduction of comprehensive education into uh, England by helping to create public pressure in the 1960s and 1970s. Such work in the Fabian tradition certainly sought to influence policy, though interestingly, in the light of what I'm going on to say, Olive Banks, who some of you will know as another early sociologist of education, was always sceptical about the extent to which even the old sociology of education actually uh, drove policy. Uh, and she also questioned whether that's what our academic work should be about. Well, after training as a teacher and teaching in a couple of contrasting comprehensive schools myself, I renewed my interest in the sociology of education by going to what was then called the University of London Institute of Education to study for a master's degree in sociology of education. Uh, this uh, was associated with uh, Michael F. D. Young and a book called Knowledge and Control, New Directions uh, in the Sociology of Education and came to be known as new, the New Sociology of Education, which self-consciously distanced itself from the old Sociology of Education of Halsey and Flood that I'd encountered at Cambridge. Rather than locating the problem of working class underachievement in what social and cultural resources children did uh, or did not bring to school, the new sociology of education rather reversed that argument and said the crucial determinant of who succeeded and who failed in schools was what they actually encountered in schools, the nature of the curriculum and pedagogy they encountered. Uh, and it was therefore hardly surprising that middle class children succeeded because they understood the culture of the school, which was essentially consonant with their own. And so for the new sociologist of education, this seemed to justify tearing up the uh, old grammar school curriculum uh, and traditional teaching methods and introducing various forms of progressive or child-centered uh, pedagogies or alternative curricula so that uh, these would be closer to the experience of working class children and hey presto they would succeed and by implication the middle class kids would probably fail. There was a move away from the policy focus of the old sociology of education and a focus on bringing about the revolution through changing curricula and classroom practices. I characterised that at the time as naive possibilitarianism which is one of two concepts that people um, attribute to me. I only put the naive on it, possibilitarianism was already there. But what it basically means is that people seem to believe that if they change the curriculum, the world would, uh, would change. Uh, and I pointed out the curriculum as it existed was but one of a number of possibilities, yes, but the ones which actually were in place serve particular social functions that might not be so easily uh, overturned. Similar arguments were put forward by Sharp and Green at the time, and by the late 1970s, a uh, new sociology of education too, as I call it there, uh, a more economic determinism, a determinist approach influenced by uh, American neo-Marxist writers Bowles and Gintis um, came to dominate and in complete contrast to the possibilitarianism uh, of the earlier phase, much of this neo-Marxist work seemed to deny any real possibility of change from within the education system whose nature was structurally determined by the needs of the capitalist economy. So a complete flip from saying we can change everything from within to basically we can change nothing uh, from within. And it seemed that even everyday professional practices carried out by well-meaning teachers merely sustained broader structures of oppression whose origins lay elsewhere. Uh, and even pupil agency was often seen to contribute to social and cultural reproduction in the work of writers like Paul Willis uh, and Paul Corrigan, demonstrating how working class pupils actively uh, participated in their own positioning uh, in the class structure. At this, by this time I was teaching uh, at the University of Bath, and by this time I met Christine Eden, who was uh, teaching at the predecessor to this uh, institution. I was seen by people here 
as an exponent of New Sociology of Education too, uh, and indeed my boss, Professor Kenneth Orstwick, used to refer to me and another uh, of my colleagues as the Marx Brothers. <laughs> he wasn't alone in seeing this stuff in an unsavoury light. Both phases, in fact, of the new sociology of education were seen as dangerous by new right critics, particularly in terms of their potentially damaging impact on teachers. Uh, one argued that sociology of education, initially ineffectual, presumably new sociology of education one, uh, was no longer harmless uh, in new sociology of education too and should be cut out of courses for student teachers to improve the intellectual and moral environment in which would-be teachers are taught. In reality, I would say the influence of uh, sociology of education on policy and practice at that time was probably much less significant than either its advocates or its critics feared. Michael Young, whose photograph you saw just now, has rightly pointed out to me that our own joint work in the mid-1970s doesn't easily fit into either the possibilitarianism uh, phase or the deterministic phase uh, that I've just described. And certainly, par partly because I was a bit disillusioned with all of it, I moved my interest in the 1980s towards education policy and empirical studies of education policy making, with a view to feeling maybe this was something that could be used to uh, influence policy. So I was back to my naive 18-year-old uh, belief that I could uh, make a difference. But during this period, of course, uh, English education became overtly politicised. Characteristic characterizations of the world by the new sociology of education, either one or two, um, were brought up against a, a, a political reality um, with Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government introducing neoconservative policies of state control uh, and prescription through the national curriculum and national uh, assessment, while also encouraging neoliberal market forces through parental choice and school autonomy. And the sociology of education in this period became uh, increasingly dominated by the sociology of education policy. And it, it wasn't just me who went in that direction. Um, although it had been a feature of the work I myself had undertaken at King's College London in the early 1980s after I left Bath, it soon, uh, sociology of education policy soon became identified uh, with the group that grew up there around my successor Stephen Ball. And their work was centrally on the role of middle class advantage in the perpetuation of working class disadvantage and as how policy, uh, particularly Thatcherite policy, uh, facilitated this uh, in myriad ways. Another group uh, joined me here in the West Country at what was then Bristol Polytechnic where I headed up the education faculty in the second part of the uh, 80s before I headed back uh, to London in 1990 to work first at uh, Goldsmiths College and then uh, succeeding Basil Bernstein at the Institute of Education. And some of the fruits of my labours there um, are represented on that slide. Much of the work at uh, King's and the Institute uh, was a response to the reforms of um, the Thatcher government initially uh, and critiques focused on neoliberal policies as they called them. There was not much real belief that this was about influencing policy, it was about critiquing policy. And while its value position entailed outrage at the socially regressive effects of Thatcherite policy, I almost sometimes felt there was a temptation to uh, welcome outrageous policies because they provided yet more of an occasion for critique. So you sort of woke up, you don't know what they've done now? You know, we can really uh, go to town uh, on that. And I see some of you recognise that uh, particular approach. However, uh, when Tony Blair's new Labour government was elected in 97, we hoped, I, I won't say I hoped strongly, but I hoped that the sociology of education might move beyond critiquing policy uh, and have some po positive influence on policy itself. In practice, the new government uh, continued Thatcherite policies by and large, 
by its emphasis on parental choice and school diversity as the key to educational improvement and closing the social class attainment gap. Um, but their policies were increasingly at odds with the arguments of sociologists of education like Stephen Ball uh, and uh, his colleagues. So policy influence, even under Blair, was uh, limited. Although I should say I can claim one policy influence right at the start of the uh, Blair government, which was the abolition of the previous government's assisted places scheme, uh, which was interesting. The first policy introduced by the Thatcher government um, was uh, a, a policy that, in its rhetoric, claimed to take uh, poor, bright, working class kids from inner city areas and put them into uh, elite private schools. And uh, our research during the 1980s has shown the policy didn't work, at least as far as its core target group was concerned. It, it was quite good at supporting distressed middle class families, um, but not its core uh, group. Each year they tended to bring out a lorry driver's child in, in the photo shot. Um, but uh, they had to, <coughs> um, and, and the odd black child, but by and large it was dominated by the children of lower paid uh, middle class families or downwardly mobile uh, mid middle class uh, families. Each year uh, our research was cited in parliamentary debates by the Labour Party uh, claiming uh, that this money was being wasted and the first policy of the Blair government which was announced was the abolition of the scheme um, and a uh, decision to put the money uh, into reducing class sizes in infant school which they said um, would benefit uh, children uh, in, from disadvantaged inner city families. More, uh, more of that later. So that, that was my great claim to influence. Of course, it went with the tide a bit. I mean, it was a supposedly a socially progressive policy to uh, abolish it. Uh, but on the other hand, it was a parental choice policy, so um, it wasn't totally consonant with the rest of um, Blair's policies. So, so, so maybe it, it did have a, uh, a unique uh, influence. After B the Blair and Brown governments, we had even less influence over the coalition government uh, elected in 2010. Now this is history that the younger ones amongst you will begin to uh, rec recognise. The coalition continued and extended new Labour policies on academies, added in free schools, but at the same time, following more traditional poli uh, conservative policies, such as um, emphasis on tr a traditional curriculum and traditional uh, examinations. So the nature of school knowledge was put firmly back on the agenda by Michael Gove uh, in quotes like that actually when he was in opposition and he took the view that what working class children needed to succeed was exposure to the traditional curriculum the traditional curriculum that New Sociology of Education 1 of course had argued was the root of the problem. So we had a whole series of reforms the epitome of which was the English Baccalaureate, which sought to roll back any tendent skill-based curricula and progressive approaches to teaching and assessment. Now, ironically, my former collaborator, Michael Young, whose earlier work, Knowledge and Control, had been seen as supportive of uh, progressive approaches to education, now distanced himself uh, from that position and questioned whether, uh, in fact, uh, that uh, had been right and that uh, he now argued progressive curricula were even more socially regressive. Kids who didn't get formal knowledge or high status knowledge in school uh, um, didn't get it at home uh, and therefore they won't uh, get to university. And his uh, no bringing knowledge back in in 2008 was a critique of progressivism and constructivism and indeed the new sociology of education itself, at least as powerful as anything offered by uh, conservative politicians. I think I have become increasingly frustrated with the faddishness of the sociology of education and this flip-flop 
uh, approach, sort of moved away from it. And indeed, soon after I was appointed director of the Institute of Education in 2000, someone referred to me as Jeff Whitty, who used to be a sociologist of education. Um, I think that was a critical introduction, um, not, not a jokey one like Kate's. And in a way, I suppose it's true that I foresee the sociology of education to become an education administrator and to become more involved in policy analysis uh, with a less uh, distinctively sociological bent. And I suppose also for the time being, because of my roles as director of the Institute but also president of the British Educational Research Association, I became much more involved with generic issues in educational research and in trying to uh, represent our whole field to government. And in 2005, I gave the Beer of Presidential Address, and I don't think I even explicitly mentioned sociology of education uh, in that address. Rather, I focused on what was becoming a key issue for education research in general at that time, the uh, so-called what works agenda and the push from government for research to be orientated uh, ever more strongly towards offering immediate answers uh, to questions of policy and practice. And ever since that time, the mantra of evidence-based policy and practice and research for use has been pursued with increasing enthusiasm. And it's uh, going to be um, the focus of the rest of my talk, particularly the limitations of that approach. One of my prime concerns in 2005 was the possible narrowing of the kinds of educational research deemed worthy of funding. I argued that we should expect some education research to be aligned in various ways with uh, immediate questions of policy, but some research, might, which was entirely valid, might be regarded by government, rightly or wrongly, as being of limited value and irrelevant uh, to uh, their uh, interests work in the history of education might be an example. I also argued that even some of the required policy-facing research uh, might not turn out to be supportive of current uh, reform agendas and might well be perceived uh, as unhelpful and oppositional uh, to government. Politicians weren't necessarily really prepared for that. But I argued that such a range of orientations was entirely appropriate for education research in a free society, and I remain of the view that a healthy education research community must be a broad church, uh, encompassing activity that responds to uh, external priorities, yes, but also curiosity and discipline-led inquiry. At that time, I pointed to a number of worrying signs that this approach was under attack, particularly in the hands of politicians and the press, David Blunkett in particular, but also, uh, and a bit earlier but continuing, people from within uh, the field like David Hargreaves who attacked education research for being poor value, remote from practice and often of indifferent uh, quality. But what I said was the challenge uh, for the education research community was to take these criticisms seriously and redress genuine shortcomings and imbalances, but also defending its breadth such that other people's assumptions and priorities didn't come to try and uh, reshape the field in their own image uh, in the way that I think uh, people like David Blunkett wanted to, and certainly Charles Clark who succeeded him. This meant resisting attempts to impose narrow or inappropriate quality criteria. Uh, even in uh, 2005, the worst case scenario I pointed to was that research in the what works mould would become the only sort of research in education that was able to attract funding on any scale. And the subsequent creation by the coalition government in 2010 of the Education Endowment Foundation with a focus uh, at that time on randomised control trials represented a clear step in that direction. There was a big push towards an impact uh, agenda which um, research councils increasingly uh, asked you to predict the impact you were going to have and um, the research assessment exercise, subsequently the research excellence framework, became more and more concerned with impact uh, and in the REF, the research excellence framework, 
um, based on a fairly crude notion of the relationship between research uh, outputs and research uh, impact. And one of the main findings uh, of the evaluation of universities' REF preparations uh, last time around uh, was uh, of the great difficulty teams had in evidencing impact. And they went out of their way to try and show, you know, we spoke to this government minister, um, you know, trying to do what I was just doing with the assisted places scheme, but with probably less <coughs> justification. But nearly all the, the, the cases in the social sciences were about influencing government policy. It has been said so, some people actually lied in those uh, submissions, but I couldn't possibly comment uh, on that. More pertinent to what I'm saying is respondents to the evaluation voice concerns that in future universities and researchers will prioritise research that can more easily demonstrate immediate impact, even if it was trivial. So you, you, you could be pushed into a position of saying, well, if I've got to show impact, I'm going to do something low risk, low tariff. It's not about researchers slavishly orienting their work to the REF requirements overnight, but subtle shifts in the, the overall profile of, of research. Now I know uh, the, you can say the REF allows you to look back over, what is it, 15 years um, to show the impact of your uh, department's work. But I always recall Basil Bernstein, my, my mentor, um, saying, talking about sleepers and pointing out how much research wasn't that its relevance only became recognised later. And this is, of course, true in nuclear science as well, with disastrous uh, outcomes. But um, sleepers uh, is a term used to refer to research that um, you know, didn't seem to be policy relevant at the time, but then subsequently comes to be uh, seen in a new policy situation as relevant. Furthermore, the impact agenda is already affecting how we present ourselves to the outside world. In recent years, there been lots of reports saying how valuable social science research is, showcasing how we have contributed to policy agendas. BIRA has done this, and the Campaign for Social Science, uh, in a report in 2015 called The Business of People, focuses on behavioural science and the use of big data to show how they can contribute to policy decisions um, and informing behavioural nudges um, within existing structures. Obviously these are unashamedly oriented towards politicians uh, to get their support, but part of the problem of not seeking to represent social science uh, or education research in the round is to almost appear embarrassed about other sorts of work and, and hide it and, 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 and marginalise it. And I'm not suggesting uh, that discipline shouldn't influence policy, but it'd be unfortunate if this was to be seen as their only uh, purpose. Nor am I uh, questioning the general aspiration to strengthen the interchange between research and policy for some types of research. Uh, it makes sense. But I do actually worry, even for those types of research, about how utopian visions of a cosy relationship between research and policy could uh, lead to uh, rather unfortunate outcomes, also influence funding. Uh, there have already been a number of indications that both blue skies and critical research traditions are precariously positioned. It could be that schools of education uh, in particular, given that's what we are, will need to think differently about their research activity. And if departments uh, do that, then individual researchers are going to do that. And uh, I think the nature of educational research will be narrowed uh, detrimentally. Now, some of you may say, well, it's worth it if we can actually influence policy and achieve impact. But I think before making a decision to do that, we need to recognise the structural and cultural disjunctions that exist even between policy-facing research and the realities of policy-making in practice. In my 2005 Bira presidential address, I hi highlighted just how far both research and policy would need to travel 
um, to live up to the uh, apparent goals of evidence-based policy making. Even if there was a shared understanding uh, and unanimous recognition that it was a desirable uh, development, which there isn't. So there's a danger that if research for use becomes the main driver in research policy and funding, education research might not only become narrower and shorter term, but might operate on a false prospectus of a brave new world. Uh, and if that brave new world isn't delivered, uh, leading to frustration on all sides, as well as a denuded discipline, and ultimately, I would argue, even less considered policy making. So the issue is not so much whether there should be constructive engagement between researcher and user communities, but rather how far it should go and what form it should take. Over 40 years ago, in his inaugural address to the newly formed Bira, John Nisbet claimed that we'd moved then, 40 years ago, uh, uh, ago, away from the naive idea that problems are solved by educational research, or what he called the old educational science idea. Rather, he characterised the relationship between research and policy as indirect and more about sensitising policy makers to problems rather than solving them. Yet the current What Works agenda has seen a resurgence of this educational science idea, not least in the enthusiasm of many policy makers and some researchers for a medical uh, model of educational research in which uh, experimental methods and particularly randomised controlled trials are regarded as the gold standard and systematic reviews run a close second. Ben is on the right. Kevin Collins, who, who heads up the um, Education Endowment found Foundation. But Ben is the public intellectual um, who you will all be familiar with. In my view, Nisbet's warning 40 years ago that educational research may not provide final answers to questions or even objective evidence to settle controversies and his support for a wide spectrum of research needs to be heeded afresh. Despite claims of all parties that they engage in evidence-based policy, they themselves are rather more prone uh, to uh, seek policy-based evidence. There's relatively little use of evidence, actually, other than an anecdotal in politicians' speeches or even uh, in white papers and the like. Uh, and it's somewhat naive of us to expect there would be. And I, in, in my new book, I cite a number of examples where education policy has been driven by ideological and electoral considerations rather than research evidence. Let me just give you a couple of examples. One follows from what I said about the abolition of the assisted places scheme. There were actually very few class sizes over 30 in disadvantaged inner city areas. And there were an awful lot of classes over 30 in the leafy suburbs. What was presented in the manifesto as a socially progressive policy could actually be seen as an absolutely cynical piece of uh, election politics um, because Labour didn't need votes from the inner city. It got them or people didn't vote there. What it needed to do was to swing the suburban areas. And you may say that's too cynical on my part, but I spoke to David Blunkett after the election where he would say, well, the point is to win power and then we do it. So I said, will you go into the next election with a commitment to reduce class sizes below 15 uh, in disadvantaged areas because the research actually shows that reducing them from 31 to 28 is not significant, but reducing them below 50. Um, he didn't give that commitment and, of course, it wasn't in the, uh, the manifesto. But I've just come across an, an another example of electoral politics uh, influencing policy. Um, do you remember that uh, David Cameron uh, made a great splash recently by saying there were more black young men in prison than at Russell Group universities? Well, that was actually totally wrong, and it hasn't been widely publicised that he got his figures wrong. Um, so that's interesting in itself. What's interesting from the point of view of my theme is that um, UUK was then asked to set up a social mobility uh, a group uh, to look at what could be done about this. And researchers were asked for information uh, about what works uh, in widening participation. It then became clear that the main finding of the research, which is you have to intervene in primary schools, and certainly below year nine, was not considered relevant 
because impact had to be achieved by 2020. So you had to have interventions in the upper uh, phases of secondary school which had already really um, reached saturation point and which the research showed uh, was not really where it matters. So two examples then of, of electoral considerations rather than research evidence driving policy. Of course, some politicians are refreshingly clear about this, about the limited relevance of educational research. Charles Clark, who I actually got on quite well with when, when I was director of the Institute, even though he hated educational research, was quite open about this. I'm not interested in this stuff, Jeff. And then we, we took it from there. Um, but I've even heard it alleged that one minister uh, said he didn't want research, more research on something because it might give him the wrong answer. And I think that's... that. that you know, that's honesty. <laughs> As I wasn't there, I'm not going to say who, who that was. Um, but I will say uh, that one uh, current uh, minister, in a very recent speech on school autonomy, uh, blatantly drew selectively on OECD research where it supported his position and dismissed it in the same speech uh, where it didn't. Not that education policy alone is uh, subject to the idealised tenets of evidence-informed policy and theory, but to electoral considerations in practice and other considerations. Paul Flynn uh, of the House of Commons uh, Public Administration Committee has put it neatly, much of our policy uh, making is evidence-free, prejudice-driven and hysteria-driven, particularly hysteria uh, generated by the press. So we need to recognise that will be used when it suits us, when our research goes with the tide, but not when more important considerations than research evidence uh, come into play. I think one senior civil servant once told me at most 2% of influence on policy comes from research. So we're building a world based on false assumptions. Um, and it's interesting that some of the most ardent and serious advocates of research-informed policy outside the academy are also beginning to wonder uh, whether this brave new world is actually going to happen. James uh, Turner of the Sutton Trust and the EEF, who's been at the heart of developing evidence-informed policy, has more recently uh, argued that the rhetoric was considerably easier than the re reality, um, that it's difficult uh, to uh, make uh, links between researchers and policy makers work. Part of it he, he puts down to academics being more interested in indulging their academic interests than providing useful and practical results, which is no doubt true, but he also recognises there are problems on his side of the fence. Uh, and he moves away from uh, going hook, line and sinker for um, evidence-based policy and suggests an incremental approach uh, to improvement. Though he is ultimately still attracted by a refinement of the education uh, science model, he recognises that the grand claims of evidence-informed policy need to be informed by more modest ambitions, at least for now. But my conclusion is not that we'll gradually get there. My conclusion is that the messy real world of educational politics that he points to also justifies maintaining the diversity of education research and abandoning any expectation that a particular approach will ever be the whole story. And that uh, has taken me back uh, to the sociology of education. My flirtation with um, what works and evidence-informed policy uh, is well over. Uh, and that's really what my new book uh, is about. What my first chapter in this book does is to elaborate on the case I've just been making to you uh, about the limitations of evidence-based policies. And the next two chapters are case studies of just how far education policy sometimes strays uh, from uh, the evidence-based or evidence-informed rhetoric. One illustration is in relation to the reform of teacher training in England under the coalition government, which you will all be familiar with, where policy is much more driven by new right ideology than research evidence on the effectiveness of provision, and you're living through that uh, at the moment. Um, the following chapter looks at how research evidence uh, is used in international policy borrowing, uh, and how, uh, particularly between the UK and the US, and how far that falls short of the protocols expected in academic research. 
and it suggests that this whole what works agenda masks a predilection for reforms that are ideologically consistent with a wider political agenda associated with what Pazi Saarberg has termed germ or the global educational reform movement. My next two chapters fulfil a commitment I made when I retired as director of the IOE that one of the things I would do was uh, review the research evidence on ways of narrowing the social class achievement and participation gap. Um, that project was somewhat delayed by illness, but uh, it, it is now there between covers. But not surprisingly, it shows that even in areas of considerable political consensus, like those, uh, those policies, at least at a, at a high level, the evidence doesn't simply speak for itself, and nor is it at all conducive to the quick fix solutions uh, that appeal to uh, politicians. So in writing these chapters, I found myself drawn increasingly back to sociological theories, especially theories of social and cultural reproduction. And who are these two? It's left is Bernstein, right is board, yeah. While such sociological work isn't necessarily undertaken with a view to policy impact, I found it really helpful in understanding why policies on the achievement gap and widening participation have had such limited impact uh, and what might be needed to enhance their impact. So I end the book with a plea for more discipline-based research on education and specifically the sociology of education to remain a broad-based, part of a broad-based conception of the field of education research. And in doing so, I align myself with Sir Fred Clark, one of my most eminent predecessors as director of the London Institute, who once said that educational theory and educational policy that take no account of sociological insights <coughs> will be not only blind, but positively harmful. And this means that a lot of educational research will not be about providing solutions to policy problems in any simple sense. Much of it will entail elucidating and examining the nature of problems, which in turn makes the politician's simple dichotomy of useful and useless research mentioned earlier unhelpful. In this context, educational researchers need to embrace the role of public intellectual rather than that of political servant or technician. Uh, and I find it interesting how, at a time when academics in other disciplines, like Ben Goldacre, um, are adopting the role of public uh, intellectuals, we find few, if any, amongst our education colleagues uh, in the UK who, who take that role. Um, it, 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 I mean, um, Kate was saying we were at uh, the American Education Research Association, and one of the big focuses there was engaged or public scholarship. Uh, and that doesn't mean, it did to some of them, mean uh, influencing politicians. It means something much wider uh, about uh, the public mind on education. And it seems to me in taking on such a role, it's possible to engage with policy in less constrained way than the debate around evidence-based policy and what works often implies. And it makes our constituency <coughs> the public as much as politicians or, or think tanks. Um, and uh, encourages us to engage more broadly with public attitudes to education policy and reform. It doesn't mean eschewing the impact and public ed engagement agendas, but it does mean reframing them away from any narrow policy engagement. And interestingly, that takes me right back to where we started, the old sociology of education, um, which I first encountered in that study group uh, at Cambridge University in 1965. Chelly Halsey, A.H. Uh, Halsey, its leading exponent, once argued that the task of the sociologist uh, is literally to inform the debate. Um, and sociologists in this country, as I've said, have become less informed in public policy debates recently, but their role in making sense of the evidence remains crucial as I hope my book uh, demonstrates. So I, I'm hoping that the sociological voice uh, in policy, but uh, if in policy if possible, but more in broader public debates might be uh, reinstated. Um, and indeed, as I said earlier, 
the old sociologist's influence on comprehensive education was as much through its influence on the wider climate of opinion as it was in directly influencing policy behind closed doors. All of us have been, not all of us, but many of us, have been, if you like, seduced into policy evidence to ministers. Um, but they only want it for their own purposes. Uh, and so I think we could better spend our time uh, in public uh, context. And it may be that our influence uh, might be stronger now that old and new sociologists are saying similar rather than contradictory things about the limits of education policy. Uh, as I said in the 1970s, I was considered, rough, somewhat reluctantly on my part, to be a new sociologist of education. Uh, and I'll take that title on here. But I said in a blog in March, IOE blog, that policymakers need to be much clearer about what schools and universities can and cannot do, or at least cannot do on their own. This is clear from recent empirical research that shows that even when disadvantaged groups achieve success in the education system, we see a shifting of the goalposts and the creation of glass ceilings and glass floors that seem to protect the position of already advantaged groups. And that's been reinforced actually since I wrote that um, by the IFS study showing uh, how um, even highly successful university graduates from disadvantaged families uh, have uh, less rewards in the workplace than those uh, with similar or even worse uh, performance at university uh, when they take up jobs in the professions and uh, business. So that's what new sociologist Jeff Whitty was saying in March. Old sociologist John Goldthorpe was saying in the same month, what can be achieved through education policy alone is limited, far more so than politicians find it convenient to suppose. To look to the education system uh, to uh, provide a solution to the problem of inequality of opportunity is to impose an undue burden on it. Rather, a whole range of economic and social policies is needed. Uh, and that message needs, uh, it seems to me, to get out. It needs uh, to be the case that we, if you like, inoculate the public uh, against uh, simplistic solutions like germ. So I'm hoping the sociologist's, sociologist's voice will be heard uh, once again uh, in making the point that what are electorally appealing policies uh, are often uh, just appealing on the surface and when you dig beneath them there ain't no way education is going to produce what politicians are claiming without them taking some hard decisions about uh, economic and social policy. I want the sociological <coughs> voice to be heard again but I want to finish by saying my argument is not limited to the importance of the sociology of education. Similar arguments apply to other foundation disciplines. Philosophy asks questions that have been equally neglected by the what works agenda. We need not only to ask whether a policy works or even under what circumstances it works and for whom, we also need to ask whether that policy was worthwhile in the first place. Um, and those aspects of education research that ask uh, these sorts of questions need to be supported rather than derided as has too often been the case uh, in recent years. Thank you.